Let's go back to verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated. See, that's predestinated. So that cannot be undone. So God already predestinated according to the purpose of him. So he already purposed it. He determined it. Who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And he works everything that goes on according to his counsel, his own will. So that is the text on the sovereignty of God where basically that anything that happens in life, don't worry, God is in control. So that gives you great peace about it. However, that can be taken to a level of extremity of the Calvinist heresy. The Calvinist heresy, they talk so much about the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty of God, in other words, God's in control of everything. So anything that happens, including the, the murder and the rape of little children, that that is according to God's will. That is according to God's counsel. Now that is totally incorrect. That is wicked and wrong. But here's the thing is that, what are we going to do about verse 11? Pastor, you said that everything that happened in life, God is in control. So I don't see, I don't see how that one differs from the Calvinist teaching. Now, this is the thing that Calvinists don't get in their mind, all right? I'm going to show you something very simple that these Calvinists go by five-hour debates on with Armenians and other people that it just goes all over the floor. You're going to be amazed how simple this is. You ready? You ready? Okay. This is what DD scholars, THDs, and PhD Calvinist scholars who know Greek and Hebrew, and they twist the floor everywhere in Scripture to try to understand sovereignty over here. All right, we agree. Amen. We agree that God is in control of everything, right? Yeah, come on. All right. He says basically this. Basically, if you do what's right and holy, right? Then you'll get blessed. He also says that when sin happen in the world, there must be consequence. So when murder and rape and everything happens, you got to realize that is the consequence of sin. If he did not decree that, if he did not say that to Adam and Eve, that, hey, because you sinned and you messed up, there has to be pain and consequence for that, then anyone can do whatever sin that they want to. God's teaching you this is the price of sin here. The price of sin in America with crime rising is this is their fruit. This is their fruit, and that's them to blame. That's not God. Amen. Ah, isn't that easy? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow, duh, over here. So everything goes according to counsel his own will. Yeah. But this doesn't mean we blame God for murder and rape and every sin. No, that's the free choice of man. Yeah. But what God decreed is in your free choice, in your sin here, there has to be payment and consequence. Oh, God, this does not eliminate free will. They assume that when God counsels decrees something, you eliminate free will. No, how do, why not increase the sovereignty of God that no matter what free choice you make, God makes sure that it's done according to his will and purpose. Yeah. Oh, how about that? How about that? Oh, gee, oh, wow. Idiots, these Calvinists. What are you going to do with the book of Jeremiah where God said, I didn't, it didn't even come to my mind when they were burning little children to yeah. false idols. Yeah. It didn't even come to God's mind over here. But is that uh, violating his counsel and will? No, he pointed out that this is the result of what sin will do. Is where little children are sacrificed, worshiping false god. That's the consequence of sin. My goodness, wasn't that easy? Now, I notice how I finished the debate in one minute. <laughs> Look at, watch these debates on YouTube. James White and uh, Matt Slick. And yeah, his last name shows how, what a slick guy that guy is. But these dishonest Calvinists doing debates, they just go all over the floor about the counsel of his own will. And you can't blame God. It is your fault. But we can't necessarily blame God, even though he willed it where that child was hurt and murdered, etc. Oh, come on, man. It, this is more easy than you think. Why not say that God is sovereign, he's still in control, everything will go according to his plan, no matter what free choice you make? Amen. Oh, it's that simple, man. Man, these idiots, man. All right, now go to Ephesians 1. Sovereignty of God eliminates free choice. No, you can increase his sovereignty. 
when man's free choice is involved. All right, let's go back. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So notice that uh, in verse 11, we obtain the inheritance. He predestinated us. Everything goes according to his counsel, what he purposed. On what? That this, this is all done, the riches of his glory. All of this, guys, all of this is done to the praise of his glory. It's all done to honor and praise him at the end. That's why at Revelation 4 and 5, those who were washed by the blood of the Lamb, they have to what? Give him glory. So guess what? You and I are going to praise and glorify God when we get up there. In verse Ephesians 1.12 is a fulfillment. It is a fulfillment of Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. Some of you don't know this, but Revelation, uh, Ephesians 1.12 is a prophecy. It is a prophecy to you Christians that you will be doing this at Revelation 4 and 5. What are you going to be doing? You're going to thank him for the blood. And you're going to cast the crown at his feet and give him praise because of the riches of his glory. All right. But notice all of this is based on what? Oh, here's a good one you want to mark down against Calvinists. Who what? Who first what? Trusted in Christ. Now look at this. All right. God gave you his grace. It cannot be undone and you can never know. No. You'll notice over here that when God gives you all of this together, that all of this happened when you first, first, first <laughs> believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. Amen. Isn't that simple? Amen. It's not, uh, you never know, and believing came after the Holy Spirit rejuvenated you and blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. You first trusted in Christ because you first trusted Him. That's the reason why you gain all these blessings. Predestination, election, um, His sovereignty working, the counsel of His own will, redemption, adoption, all of that. Based on when you first trusted in Jesus Christ. They don't like that verse. They don't like this verse. They don't like that verse. So if you're very honest, you'll notice that the ones who first trusted in Christ gained all of these uh, promises of the Lord. Now look at verse 13. In whom he also trusted. So after you believed, you trusted in Christ for your salvation. After that he heard the word of truth. So after you heard the Bible, the truth of the word of God being preached to you, the gospel of your salvation. It's the gospel that gives you salvation. When you heard all of that, that's why you trusted at verse 13. See that? After you heard it, that's why you trusted. In whom also after that ye believed, after you believed, what happens? Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. After you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, basically, you're going to like this, what I'm going to do at the board. What the Lord Jesus Christ did is that as soon as you first Believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. The Holy Spirit just sealed all this to you. Now, do you realize how blessed you are? All this for you, my friend. All of this for you. He sealed it. The Holy Spirit sealed it. Now, uh, this, is, this is really awesome. Okay, I have to wrap this up. Okay, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of what? Promise. This is all a promise. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit sealed all of this and you gained that promise. A lot of people uh, think that the baptism of the Holy Ghost goes back and forth and you have to speak in tongues harder and you have to feel the Holy Ghost harder and etc. No, it comes after believing on Jesus Christ. Amen. Notice in this verse after you believed in Jesus Christ, that's where you, the Holy Spirit sealed you, immersed you, baptized you, covered you, filled you, all of this. It happened right over here. Now, another issue is this, is some people think that because they sin, that they're going to lose the Holy Ghost. No. Look, you're sealed. How long? Which is the earnest of our inheritance. All right. What does that mean? All right. You're going to like this one. All right. Get ready to run the aisles or something. What does earnest mean? Cool. Earnest means something that has value. Yeah. All right. So you got to understand this. The Holy Spirit... 
is the earnest. It's the value here. Why? It's value to the seller when you buy something. So when the seller gives you something, you have to give that seller something in return that has value. Exactly. That's why, you know, the currency we have today has little to do with value today, as you might all know. It's, all right, we're on a borrowed system right now. All right, so your $100 bill is not something to go woohoo, all right. It actually doesn't really have that much value, but I'm not going to get into economics right now. Point is this. The point is, is that what you're giving to the seller will have great value, gold, silver, etc. when you buy something from yeah. the seller. Praise the Lord. So basically, Jesus Christ, when he had to buy you, yeah. and then he says to the seller, okay, over here, so uh, I'm buying this Gene Kim for myself, and it's definitely mine. I'm not going to lose it. It's not yours to return. It's mine because I already gave the, I put the value of the Holy Spirit here. I pay with the Amen. Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit in you is payment. Amen. Wow. It's your earnest. It's the payment. So when the Holy Spirit is sealed inside you, that's the payment. So basically, it's to rub off on the devil when he thinks that he can get you and buy, buy you back for himself. Jesus Christ says, no, the Holy Spirit's right here. Amen. I mean, I bought this child. That means he's my child. But he sinned and messed up. It doesn't matter. I bought him with the value of the Holy Spirit. I bought this child. Amen. The Holy Spirit in you is evidence that to the devil that, hey, this is my child. You can't get it back. I told you, you're going to run. All right. But let's keep reading it over here. It gets even better, which is the earnest of our what? Inheritance. See, Jesus Christ, when he gave you, man, this is a blessing. It's not something what he gained. It's what you gain. Basically, Jesus Christ bought for you. You didn't buy it yourself. So Jesus Christ, he paid the Holy Spirit as evidence to seal within you. And not only that, what was he buying, right? He had to purchase something. He purchased salvation and all the blessings in it. Amen. So where heaven is all yours, the mansion in heaven, the spiritual blessing, the inheritance of all things, he bought all that to say, hey, Gene Kim, here is for you. And the devil can't get it back. And if Satan tempts you that all these worlds are mine to give, if you bow down and worship, to, and worship me, don't you dare listen to him, Gene. He's a liar. I already gave it to you. Didn't you know you already have it now? We're going to see it later on. I, I didn't, I, it was going to connect to prayer. It was going to be very powerful, but we'll connect to that next Ephesian study. But the point is you have it now because remember verse 3. Verse 3, your spirit is connected with the Holy Spirit. Your spirit is connected to God who owns all things. So you have it right now, friend. Yeah. Yeah. The devil's a liar when he offers it all to you. Yeah. It's all yours through God. Wow. How about that? But uh, it gets even better, all right? It gets even better. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. So until what? He's going to buy back. Until he buys back what? The purchased possession. That's you, right? So remember, so you're right over here. You're the purchased possession here. So Christ bought you, and he bought everything of salvation for you. So when he bought you, he redeemed you by his blood. Remember Ephesians 1, 7? So he bought you through his blood. So what's going to happen is, so this is mine, Jesus says to the devil right now. So right now, whenever you sin and mess up, Jesus Christ is saying, this is mine. This is mine because I bought him, I bought her. The blood, the Holy Spirit is the value. You can't touch that child. And then what happens is, then he has to buy back. Who's going to buy back? Well, Jesus Christ, he bought you with his blood over here. And then what happens over here is that God the Father says, okay, time to take, time to buy back. So he's buying back. The purchase possession, what? Until the redemption of the purchase possession keep reading over here unto the praise of his glory up here yeah. so basically the rapture <laughs> so basically his purchasing process is not done yet so you know why because he saved your soul but this it's this guy's turn the flesh 
the flesh is going to come. You hear that, you wicked flesh? Yeah, yeah. So this wicked flesh turn. So then Jesus Christ bought your soul from the devil, put the Holy Spirit in there and says, okay, the Holy Spirit in it means don't touch it. All right? Yeah. So then the devil, that's why he's so mad at you, he wrecks your flesh. He gives you trial, temptation, ruins your flesh. But then God's saying, that's my purchase possession. Wait, yeah. till the time comes, then when the rapture sounds out, I'm going to buy that flesh too. I'm going to put that flesh up in glory. Yeah, glory to God. <laughs> I told you you're going to run. All right, now how do we know that? Now we have to prove this is referring to the rapture, right? So let's look at Romans 8. Now compare with Ephesians 1 and Romans 8, and then we'll end it here. All right? Man, that, that's a preaching over there. You ever heard of a teaching like that that makes you just want to jump out of your seat and go, ah! <laughs> like you won the million dollars when you scream, ah! All right, Romans chapter 8, man. Romans chapter 8. Man. So unto the praise of His glory. Remember right over here where you give Him the praise and glorify Him. That's why He has to get you back. He's telling the devil, I got to get Him to worship me, not you. So you can't offer Him the world so that that child can worship you. No, that child has to worship me. I'm buying him. Now I'll give him all, not just the whole world. I'll give him the entire everything that I created in life. All right, now, Romans chapter 8. Now, let's look at this over here. Verse uh, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the what? Glory, glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay, what is this glory that we're going to get? For the earnest expectation. Look at that, earnest, right? Verse 19. That matched with uh, Ephesians 1.14. The earnest of our inheritance, all right? The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the what? Manifestation of the sons of God. We're going to be transformed. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So that is true. Verse 20 and 21, all of creation, us creatures, we're stuck in this uh, bondage of corruption, right? We're subject to this vanity. Sin is vanity. Your flesh is vanity. But we're going to be delivered from this bondage of corruption. Keep reading the last part of verse 21. Into the what? Glorious liberty of the children of God. We're going to be, we're going to be freed from it. Keep reading verse 23. He's going to make it more specific. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, right? Because we're stuck in this bondage of corruption. We groan, waiting for the adoption to wit the what? Redemption, redemption of, our of our body. See, that's the next redemption over here. All right, so right over here, Jesus Christ redeemed you through his blood and saved your soul, gave you forgiveness of sins. But the redemption just keeps going on. It includes this wicked flesh of yours. Jesus Christ is still in the selling business and it still has value. And guess what, Satan? Jesus Christ's money don't run out. It still has value and it'll go on endlessly. Someone give a shout to the Lord, man. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. I pray, Heavenly Father, that today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers and has encouraged us that no matter how many times we sin or what people or devils or what the enemies might do to make us doubt our salvation, that we're already bought and that the Holy Spirit is our value. So it cannot be broken, Heavenly Father, and that you're going to redeem this bondage of corruption, this outer body, at the rapture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.